the down arrow that works. Oh, yeah. That works for me. This year, my project uh, is entitled, To Vent or Not To Vent? That is the question. And this was a study of altimeter bay porting. It's been long accepted that, you know, the manufacture of altimeters back even into the 90s when they were, you know, new and relatively fresh into the rocket community was, you know, portholes to vent in your altimeter. Um, and so this was a question of whether they were absolutely necessary, whether this was just folklore that has been accepted over the time and passed on down. So this is what my project entailed. The objective, like I said, was to determine whether the vent hole reports were necessary for, for getting an accurate altitude measurement of the flight. And the approach taken, uh, basically, I was one of the five people on the ECS committee that redid the rule but with the sporting code. And one of the things, and we got, we got input, I think you were one of the people we got input from, was whether vent holes were not, because we went through three iterations of vent holes. When they initially started using altimeters in our competition, it was at least a single vent hole. Then after Parkey's um, revision, it was at least three vent holes, one body caliper, and then this year, when TRIPS uh, RCP went through, it's just multiple vent holes, but there's no body caliper as long as it's on, not on a nose section. So we've had three iterations, but we're gonna go into our fourth as of July 1st, because in the new rule book, it's not required anymore. It's all on the competitor. The question becomes, do we have to do it? And the feedback we received from some of the FAI flyers said, generally, it's not required FAI, and most of them don't use it or have a way that they know how to get invented. So I chose to um, figure out whether or not is it truly necessary, uh, because obviously a lot of people are just going to throw an altimeter and they go, oh, I don't have vent holes, and they're not going to test it. And they might get bitten. We shall see. So um, I, I basically um, created a vacuum chamber. This is my vacuum chamber. Simple, uh, cheap, actually free, stuff around the house. And um, you know, obviously you can't pull a perfect vacuum, but model rockets don't fly in a perfect vacuum. So this would simulate everything I needed to do. Uh, the other thing approach about this was with six altimeters, I was going to be putting up about 250 bucks a flight. The hay was pretty long around my house, where we fly, where launch crew flies. <laughs> Didn't really want to turn it into a $2,000 R&D. Vacuum chamber should suffice for that. So this was created, and and to, and the samples were pulled within that. Uh, I did 25 samples, six altimeters in each. Um, I just said, sorry, <laughs> that one I should have. Okay, so. Um, the, the vacuum was pulled. I've also varied the speed and the amount of pull in the chamber to simulate different altitudes. Uh, my altitude readings were anywhere, I think, from 49 meters to 842 meters, which is a pretty good representative range of a significant amount of our competition. I also did a faster pull, slower pull, which is reported on the downloaded graphs. This would simulate, obviously, an egg lofter is going to lumber up there slower. Payloaders are kind of in the middle. You know, minimum diameter eight, A3, four, pit, you know, floating head piston, very efficient piston is going to scoot. And this will affect it because of whether you're going to equalize the pressure in the bay or not. And so I try to vary this to create as, as much of a real world flight simulation as I can in my living room. Uh, there's two altimeter bays created. And these were, these were made basically to simulate what pretty much all of us are flying in our competition. What type of tubing are you using? Craft paper tubing probably using some sort of balsa block or something on the bottom, and I made sure I sealed this in so there wouldn't be any variability on the, on the pores of the uh, balsa. So you basically have to deal with it. So the porosity of the craft paper. Plastic nose cones, yes, some guys use balsa, but a lot of it's gonna be vac formed, either the Pratt cones, the Apache cones, uh, with, a, with A cones are gonna be plastic. And the other thing was, I always wrapped it around a band of tape because I don't think anybody flies without making sure they're, it's expensive this way. So, these are identical. This one is plain tube, no holes. This one, I just put marker on it so I can see it has three 1 16th vent holes. And that would be the standard, what kind of what we're doing today. I mean, people will vary maybe four, maybe two, whatever. But this would easily equate to what a standard bay we're flying at. So these were the two bays, and they were placed inside the vacuum chamber. 25 tests were taken. 
uh, pulls were taken, and there's three altimeters. Um, and if you're verifying by the regional contest board chairman, probably 90 to 95 percent of the altimeters used in the Midwest and probably here at Narum are going to either be a micro peak, a peanut, or a firefly. That's going to cover pretty much everything. I well, there's been a problem of access to the Adrells, so I chose not to test them. So from that standpoint, um, since A, you can't get them right now, uh, Matt's got them here, but they're just not commonly used. So these were three reliable, heavily used altimeters. And so what I did was, he basically in the sealed, the sealed bay got a micro peak, a peanut, and a firefly. The ported bay got a micro peak, a peanut, and a firefly. And they were loaded in the same orientation every time. They were placed in the chamber. Uh, there was time allowed for them to settle. So it didn't just I pull it back in right away because that would simulate a flight. You're going to put it on the pad. It's going to, and you also want to make sure it's zeroing with the, with the room uh, atmosphere. Uh, and all, all tests were conducted at 70 degrees in my home um, with Indiana humidity. <laughs> Beyond that, uh, fa fairly similar to what you know, you're going to be flying around in most rocket ranges. And so I did 25 tests and recorded all of the results. This is the primary data table. Lots and lots of numbers. What do they mean? Micro peak is these two, peanut is these two, firefly is these two. So first sample, six altimeters in the jar. The green were the vented. Think of green, breathing. The blue, can't yeah, breathe. That was so that's where you're at on this. Now you can see, okay, there's you know, there's close stuff, there's ridiculous differences. Uh, and this was just different speeds. Now I had a, I also downloaded because Firefly doesn't record, you can't download it. So I had 100 downloads, which are in the report for the micro peak and the peanut. I didn't bring them all here because sit here flip charts, it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, that information is available on our website now. But you can compare the graphs and the speed of how things changed. Uh, if you took like a cross-sectional cut, let's say a one second mark on some of the higher altitude stuff, you could see that at that point, not a peak, but a cross-section like one second in the flight, the vented ones were showing higher because they were fairly equalized on pressure. The ones that were the more vented, you could tell were behind. They were, they was trying to get in there to equalize in the bay, but they would catch up at a more at the peak, which works fine for what we're doing if it catches up at the peak. Obviously, we're slowing down the apogee. But as you can see, it doesn't catch up very often. <laughs> uh, in 24 out of 25 tests, the vented was higher, significantly higher. The one that was actually where the vented was lower was, it was only two meters. And I attribute that to some of the micro peak flakiness. Uh, that was another side discovery of the project is that since the peanut and firefly are both, both made by perfect flight, they're using the same pressure sensor, I believe. And you can see these things are awesomely accurate. They're within a, a meter almost every single time. You know, with you know, the vented peanut versus the vented firefly. They're not floating all around. The micro peak, when compared, is kind of all over the board, which tells me it's probably more se sensitive at, to the readings and probably also has some different filtering okay, going on there. So, you know, a lot of numbers there. Um, there. There was a lot of variance in those. There shows the micro peak data. That's one. Yeah, not a whole lot of difference between the two. You get something like this with a higher altitude. This shit was, was showing significant. Other than, you know, these were fairly high altitudes, but they weren't, you know, they didn't show a lot. But, you know, you're getting these here. You're seeing a lot of difference between the vented and the non vented. The micro peak was not sensing and picking it up as quick. The peanuts and the fireflies were closer. You know, where the micro peak was here for the vented, non vented. We, we brought it with a perfect flight, two perfect flights, we more brought it down into this range. I uh, guess there are a few that are more significant, differentials like this one, but you can see it is a little bit closer if you compare the two graphs, that those, the, the, fire, the Firefly and the Peanut were able to compensate a little bit better, but you still have almost everything showing lower in the non-vent. So, what does this mean? Well, you probably really need to vent your altimeters. Um, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, even the FAI guys that aren't doing it, there's, there's some fiberglass involved there, so there is some porosity depending on how thin fiberglass is. 
and it, that depends on layup technique and what you're covering with and such as that. But for the general com competition community where you're going to be flying paper tubes, you got to have someone to get the air in there. And it, it, it blew me away how significant it was. I, I, I assumed that there would be a differential. But when it starts being like this, and we're seeing like 200 meter differentials, on the, especially high altitude slash fast accelerating, that was <coughs> extremely significant. So if you want an accurate reading, I'm done. bet <laughs> on the money. Oh, <laughs> Questions? So, so the flakiness of the micro peak, that's in a perfect world we wouldn't be flying them, or is it sort of you pay your nickel, you take your choy, take your chances, or Do you want to go into the sunlight scenarios with those things? I mean they've got some they're cool altimeters, but there's a lot of little flaky bits about micro peaks that we can go into. In this respect, I actually t I said a few things to Dan Wolf about it because he's done a lot on altimeters. I want to talk to Chris a little bit more about it. Um, we think the micro peak has probably some different filtering and may not be the pressure sensor may be a little bit more sensitive to the fact that it's not it's not get, it's it's taking those readings and it's but whoa, whoa, whoa it's still it's still top vacuum in here we're not you know equalized out it's, it's not getting it's trying to I think it's trying to probably smooth out some of that stuff where the perfect flight is not filtering quite as heavily. I think that's part of the factor. And you know, if the Adrellas become significantly more, I mean, because that's what the FAI guys are flying that are not using. If they come more available, which Matt had some here again, so hopefully he's going to be distributed around the US, that would be an alternative to add to the test. I didn't put it in there because why, why test something you can't get? You know, that, there's no point. What, I could have tested Black Shaft. I got plenty, but it doesn't help the competition community. Basically, you know, so. Still got, I still have a secret stash too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, that's one of those things. Craft paper and plastic cones, that's what everybody's going to be using. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. So, you're, you're in a non vented one, your venting was essentially however tight you made this. There was a wrap of scotch tape. Right, how it. tight was it? I mean, there's no tape here. So. No, it wrapped around the outside once oh, it was on. Around the outside? Yeah, so basically, Field. you weren't getting the airflow between the inner wall and the shoulder significantly because the tape was on there. Yeah. So where was there any air getting in? Porosity of the tube, yes, some's going to seep under the tape. Um, even though it's a CA, there may be some. You're obviously going to have little little bits of air gap that air is going to get through. It's not a perfect, you can't create a perfect you know, chamber, even if you tried to on paper. And did you put a recording altimeter in there just to watch like how long it took for a non-vented thing to lose it? Uh, to have the air well, the, the graphs, the downloads, like I said, the uh, Firefly right? doesn't doesn't record, but both the, the peanut and the micro peak did. So there's a hundred different graphs that show, and basically they'll be right next to each other. Where you'd have the micro peak right, vented, non vented. Typically, how long did it take for the air to equalize with the non vented one? Yeah, if you were to hold whole vacuum. Um, um, it was under a second, probably in most cases. Again, that that depended upon whether it was a hard pull or not, which was simulating a fast boost, yeah. and it, you know, it not being able to get the equilibrium on the faster boost, <coughs> the slower, you know, where you'd have the, you know, simulate a slow boost, the slower suction, wasn't a significant notice, you know, stability. Yeah, so which tells me that it's, it's got to try and get in there to equalize, which we all know that, so. Um, I guess it's my turn. Did you um, consider, like, you had the same three altimeters in the same uh -huh. Two each time. Did you consider mix, mix Yeah, no, they were randomly mixed. That's in my report. They were they were randomly mixed around. I got take I take all six out and read them, mm -hmm. and then I would randomly mix and reinsert. So, mm -hmm. so okay. the peanut was not the, the peanut number one was not in that every time. Right. And so there wasn't the three ever together. They were randomly once I got them out, just kind of mixed around the table. Didn't try to make sure that there was like a different one, but just let it randomize, and so that it was mixed through. That there <laughs> would not if there was a Altimeter that had a sensor that was a little off. We you know, mm -hmm. I didn't want to throw all the readings on that, so right. it would all kind of balance out in the end that way. Right. And then you had all your data, and you just kind of listed it by flight number. But what if you were taking it in order of altitude? Um, would you have seen any correlation, like a higher altitude one showed a bigger difference between venting and venting? Or would it have still looked? You would have seen it? more um, on the perfect flight. Um, the the micro peaks they were kind of more random, so not as much there. <coughs> 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 
Audience. Tom. I keep hearing a popular misconception that the altimeter chamber is being vented at the end. It's my impression that the altimeter is read by yeah, reduction in yeah, pressure. So it's actually the air coming out that makes True. a difference. But it's, it's venting out of this too. You're it's venting out, but I keep people, hearing people saying the ears have to go in. Well, we'll have to go in on the way down as well because with the recording altimeter, it's showing you the whole flight curve. In a real, in a real flight, you will see on a, on a time on, on the baseline and altitude, you know, you'll see your initial up here, and then you'll see as it descends, it will come down slower, obviously, than right. the boost. Now, with these poles, I wasn't looking to try and simulate a parachute landing. It was get the peak and then let it out slowly, but it was so there's still at some point, you know, air that had to go back into the chambers. Well, the air got to come out first. Yeah, come out, to go back in, right? You're correct. Time's up. Time's up. Okay. Thank you.